Bambro back with some Grand Tactician Civil War. This is the Union campaign that we're running in 1.07 beta. And we're that is now into version 1.0709. The biggest thing of which, uh, if I recall, I don't remember all the patch notes were. However, my understanding is, and I, I don't think we have one to show right this second, but, uh, you know, you put these weapons orders in, right? Like we've got one running right now for Springfield rifle muskets, which is called Witches? Eh, that's still... <laughs> that's still... Uh, over three months away to deliver. But uh, beforehand, whenever these weapons orders completed, they simply completed and you just had to remember <laughs> when they were due and keep an eye on the screen. Oh, that's coming in two days. The game wouldn't tell you. My understanding is that completions of a weapons order will now generate a little report. That's cool. I like that. And uh, there was something else that generates a report now that I can't quite remember. Well, you can tell I really did my uh, exhaustive homework in preparation for this episode. Huh? Anyway, the game is now going to tell us when we complete our weapons orders. That's good. Um... Right. So there's something I want to kind of readdress that I talked about in episode one. In episode one, uh, I said, pretty much, quote, uh, I'm not going to cut tons of economy stuff, but I'm going to try to talk through that stuff quicker. And not... In, in, what I was talking about there was, you know... <laughs> Just kind of a, an adjustment in the proportion of time I talk about the different topics in the game. And this being the patch, which is supposed to bring a lot of changes with the tactical AI. And I think we've seen some of that in the tactical battles. You know, I kind of wanted a higher percentage of the footage, if you will, to be on battles and a little bit less on economy, which was the focus in 1.06, under which we played the last two campaigns, the last two series. I did not say I'm going to ignore economy entirely. <laughs> I'm still playing a regular series here. I'm just trying to adjust a little bit the emphasis, but you know, I'm still going to talk economy stuff, guys. All right. With that in mind, let's talk a little bit about economy. Okay. So, obviously, the uh, union starts with a much, much better economic situation than the CSA does. And, and that is readily apparent. Uh, he looks like at the finest, you know, even without tariff act, we're pulling in 324 million in tariffs. We're pulling in 147 million in sales taxes, right? The, these numbers are way bigger than what the Confederacy has. Well, let me see if I get the tariffs to come up here. Yeah, here's our tariffs. Here's their tariff. Actually, they were pretty close until we imposed the blockade and it fell off a cliff for the CSA, right? If, if it wasn't for the blockade, yeah, they'd probably be somewhat in the same general ballpark. Ours would probably still be a little higher, but not overwhelmingly so. Uh, sales taxes. Yeah. And, you know, the nature of the game and the save games and reloading saves and stuff. It flips up and down. But in general, we're doing much better than the Confederacy there. In fact, you know, we're now... a. It's just, it's still extremely early, and we're just a couple months into the war. That said, I'm still running a surplus. Which I am actually finding pretty interesting, and didn't, didn't expect that, because I have recruited a fair number of brigades already. Not to mention spending all the money on those, uh, 
uh, Springfield rifle muskets. You know, that's a 50,000 gun order. Uh, I built a fort. <laughs> so I'm a little surprised we still have a surplus, but we do. Okay. However, there's a few in, in things like iron mines and factories and, you know, all that stuff. Ironworks. Uh, we got a lot more than the CSA does, right? It's, it's pretty well known, and I, you know, I kind of belabored the point, because it was important <laughs> in the CSA campaigns that the Confederacy only has the one iron mine. You know? <laughs> well, the, the Union's got... Quite a few. I, I didn't count them, but it's like six or seven, and they're spread in various places up here. And, and most of them are well north, too, right? They're not like sitting down here where the Confederacy can maybe capture them. There's a couple things, though, that we do not have. One item which the Confederacy enjoys that the Union does not is NIDER. N-I-T-E-R. It is a mined substance, which apparently uh, goes into the production of gunpowder. And there's only two NIDER mines on the map, and they are both in Alabama. So NIDER is one problem the CSA does not have, and we do. There is no NIDER in the Union, and it's a mine. Therefore, we can't build one. So... It doesn't mean we don't get any niter at all. It does mean we have to import all of our niter. Ostensibly from Europe or South and Central America. I don't I don't know where it comes from. I'm sure they can suss it out here in the uh, goods and trade window. But uh, we have to import all of our niter. And there's nothing that can be done about that. Uh, short of coming down here and capturing, you know... <laughs> uh, the Niter Mines in Alabama. Well, if you get that far, then other things have already been going very, very well, right? So maybe eventually, late campaign, we might have a Niter Mine. Until then, we're importing it all. One other thing that the Union does not start with is salt. Right now, we're having to import all of our salt, too. What is salt used for? Salt is used for the production of leather I guess it's part of the curing process, right? I guess that makes sense. And leather, in turn, is used for the production of clothing. Which, I don't think clothing is directly a product that is needed for the armies. It is an important consumer product. Uh, which will then feed into private wealth, you know, which impacts uh, support and national morale. So, you know, th there's, there's a few items in the game, in the economy, that aren't directly needed for the armies, but are still important for the functioning of the overall national economy. Clothing is one of them. Uh, bricks are another. Uh, we've got quite a few brickworks. In any case, salt is also used for the production of food, which in turn feeds into the production of provisions. Now, we're doing okay on food and provisions, and I think clothing as well. However, the salt which feeds into that is all having to be imported. And we'll have in, in as high price as a result. It's high value. Let's just take a look. Where's salt? Yeah, see, salt. <laughs> Almost 700,000 demanded. And we somehow managed to produce a grand total of a 1.54k somewhere without a salt works. Uh, but high value, okay. So if we get some domestic salt production going, we, we can bring that price down and it'll just make the economy work better. Uh, so unlike the Nida Mines, there is something we can do about that and uh, we can plop down some salt works. So that is an agricultural subsidy item. 
And so one way that I could do that is, okay, wait for the subsidies to pile up and then place the salt works and that'll be cheaper. And for a much more expensive building, like, or upgrade, like say for an iron mine upgrade, that's very expensive. That's more expensive than like a fort or what have you. And in the CSA campaign, I did wait for industry subsidies to pile up enough to upgrade this mine down here. Salt works though, it's a kind of a low level building. It's not that expensive, and as I already mentioned, the Union already has, it, we're still enjoying the surplus right now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and plop a couple of salt mines. Now that is going to use up the ag subsidies that I currently have. But I think I would rather do it this way than wait to accrue all the ag subsidies required. Because what I want the ag subsidies for right now, the reason why I have agricultural subsidies enabled, is for the farm mechanization project. Well, if I wait and build two salt works, that's just going to delay that much more the coming of, you know, getting those project levels that I want. So I'm going to go ahead and spend the money out of the treasury, burn a little bit of that surplus, I'm going to plop down a couple of salt works. And while I'm thinking, if I'm doing it now because I'll forget if I don't. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we've got agriculture at very high already. Oh! Okay. Um, I had pegged politics at very high because I wanted to quickly get that Hall Carbine project. We got that project, therefore, politics coming back down to none. Eventually, eventually we'll have to increase us a little bit as we get more and more policies. And we'll need politics subsidies to get policies higher than uh, seven. But we're, that's not going to be until next year, 1862. Okay, so ag subsidies is where I want, and, uh... Okay, so leather and food, the two items for which salt are needed, uh, I believe that they're both produced in factories, and so I kind of scouted out a couple spots. There's a couple big factories here near Syracuse. There's one here, right next to Syracuse, and then within Syracuse's area, there's also one up here at Watertown. These are both tier three factories. There's a butt ton of workforce in the area, and there's a tremendous amount of demand for salt because we get a very good price here. So I'm going to put one here. You can see there 100% available workforce in that little tooltip in the kind of the lower right. 100% available workforce here and. Uh, price level of sold goods, very expensive, 97%. And this will feed uh, salt right into these two factories. I'm kind of putting it equidistant between the two, kind of here near the... Can I stick it in between? Yeah, let's put it in between the road and the railroad for infrastructure reasons. That looks like a great place. Yeah, so that cost us uh, about six million, some of which was paid by the ag subsidies. Six million, I'll go ahead and plop it. If it was like eighteen or million or something like that, and yeah, maybe wait for the subsidies. This area over here, not quite as good, but I kind of was thinking, let's get one going in the east and one going in the west. And so there's a, a factory at Chicago and one at Indianapolis. Got to put a salt works over in this area. Now, is this going to make us self-sufficient in salt and not have to import any at all? I don't think so. But it'll help bring the cost down, right? More domestic production, not having to import quite as much. Just more salt in the market in general. We'll bring that price down, right? So we're paying less for the imported salt since we're not importing as much and we'll get a little bit more into the economy that way and I think that'll help 
And let's see, here about halfway between Indianapolis and Chicago, kind of sitting here on this railroad, and we're getting uh, a 90% very expensive and an 89% available workforce. I think that sounds just dandy. There we go, we got a couple salt works going now. And that actually cost a little bit more. That was 7.5 million. Huh. Not really sure why there was a difference. Could be infrastructure. Could be the availability of bricks and wood in the area. I've seen some... It, it's, it's one of these things... You know, this is a very detailed game. It gives you a lot of information. But there's a lot of information it doesn't give you. And I've seen a good bit of speculation... That makes perfect sense, by the way. I, I think it's probably pretty valid uh, conjecture that brickworks in wood, the local availability of it uh, feeds into construction costs. If it does, it makes sense. I would not be surprised at all if that were the case. Oh, Indianapolis is down here. Yeah, maybe I should have put it down a little bit closer to the river. Yeah, it's there. It's fine. Which, oh, by the way, uh, since I was talking about that, in an earlier campaign, kind of went through a little discussion about why it ran into a situation where no matter wh where we built ships, we saw the, quote, normal price, but for some reason... I was seeing a very, very low ship construction cost in um, Biloxi. And somebody brought up, there's a lumber mill right by Biloxi, right? Just feeding right into the same IIP as the port. And the conjecture, the speculation was, again, sounds pretty reasonable. <laughs> That, that local availability, that oversupply of wood, uh, help the construction costs of ships in Biloxi. Do I know that's really happening? I don't know. But I don't know any other reason why I had such cheap shipbuilding costs in Biloxi in that campaign. So, sounds like a pretty good possibility. To the point I'm kind of wondering... Do we have any union ports that have a lumber mill nearby? I don't know if I want to build one. There's a bank all the way up here in Portland, Maine. That's interesting. No, there's no ports up there. Well, you know what? Let's just, uh... Where's wood fertility? Let's do this. How's about... How much money would it cost us to build a lumber mill? We could actually do it. Fertility doesn't look all that hot. No, no, I want a port. It's a little bit higher here. Let's put a lumber mill right here by... No, I, I don't want to do it that way. I, I want there to be a town. Well, 
Oh, I'm completely kind of going off on a tangent here. Is there a port in Chicago? There is. The fertility sucks. We'll go with theory. It is an I, I. The reason I want a town nearby is because I want to make sure that there's an IIP that will actually gather that wood. And I don't know if a port will do that or if I need a town IIP to do that. Fertility is not that great on the seaboard. How about Boston? Yeah, it's crap. Plus, we, this is not a good workforce area. Okay, I'm gonna... I'm a buffalo. I think we have a winner. 81% available workforce, very expensive. Uh, and 50% fertility for wood. I'm going to put a lumber mill here. <coughs> Excuse me. And we're going to use Buffalo as our shipbuilding center. Okay, and here's how I'm going to do it. Now that may seem like, oh my god, that seems way out of the way. You're not going to want ships up there. It doesn't matter. I'm going to build one little fleet. At Buffalo. Here we go. I don't think it matters who commands it. Let's find the worst naval officer we can that we don't want anywhere else, not even in a scout. <laughs> The interesting thing about that is, strangely, by and large, naval officers and for both CSA and USA, just on average, kind of the no-name, lower, yeah, they seem often kind of on average better than the Army commanders. Commodore Andrew Allen Harwood, you are now the commander of the United States Navy Shipyard Command. Let's put one of our... Yeah. All your... <laughs> I've got a butt-ton of frigates <laughs> building. That's all I got. Everything else is out doing something. And USS American, the little ship's tender gunboat, uh, is going to be your command vessel for the shipyard. Right. So then what we'll do is every time that I want to go build some ships, I will simply go into the fleet view, right? To the shipyard command, select this fleet. But then I come up in here and I, do, I don't build it to the fleet. I build it to the uh, ships and harbor. And this is just a pool. And it just, uh, you know, I can use that ship anywhere. Should it be that way? No. 
<laughs> is that something that they ought to fix in a future update when they finally getting around to, uh, you know, fixing naval stuff? Yes. But that's the way the game mechanics work for now, okay? And we'll see if the presence of that lumber mill right here at Buffalo impacts the prices of ships. Okay, so we got that little experiment baking. And I think I've spent enough money. Probably going to have to issue credit next. Or maybe not. I don't think I spent enough to overcome that 59 uh, surplus. So maybe not. Oh, well, possibly. Because I'm pretty sure this is a yearly surplus, right? May, may, the tooltip may even say. Yeah, that's surplus per year. So that's more like five million a month. Yeah, and so yeah, we're negative here. We're, we're gonna we're gonna have to issue some debt. But I think our economy is in a place where we can do that. Okay. And then before getting off the subject of economy. I think I said something along the lines of, I'm just not going to build that many buildings in this campaign. And I said that right in the same time period, right in the same discussion where I said, I'm not going to talk as much about economy. Okay. But those two statements are not linked. I'm not building fewer buildings because I'm putting less emphasis on the economy in this campaign. I'm building fewer buildings because of what I learned over the course of the last campaign. But, you know, kind of the viewpoint that I've developed is that I don't need that many buildings. <laughs> if, if, I were, if I were doing another CSA campaign and doing an economy focus and everything, I, I would be doing the same thing. Right? And I think y'all saw me kind of shift into that mindset as the last campaign went on. Um, and when I say buildings, I'm specifically talking about these federal buildings, right? Hospitals, markets, news agencies, prison camps. None of which I've built a ton of before, but especially markets, right? These cost uh, about three million a piece, and which isn't a tremendous amount on you know for one market but my impression is that for markets to really kind of make themselves felt you got to build a lot of them right because what they do is they improve infrastructure in their local area so every market you build you know you get a little bitty red blob right like well we have a few right we have a few pre-built that we start with, so what market influences? Okay, so we got some markets up here around Baltimore, Philadelphia, etc. And so you have this little area where, okay, the infrastructure is a little better, and that helps. And these are good places to have markets, because these are pretty, you know, they're near ports and uh, in large cities. But if you want to facilitate the movement of, say, you know, you've got goods up here and you want them down here in Maryland, right? And even in this relatively well-developed area, okay, so you have improved infrastructure here, here, and here, but not in between, right? You got these gaps. And so it's not clear that... You know, do we need basically market influence all the way unbroken is it enough that just the major cities have it right are goods still flowing better even though there's a gap here and a gap here I, I don't know and in fact the the mechanics of goods flow in the game over any appreciable distance even in the even after 1.6 has gone live, that is still an area that I think the devs are 
kind of wrestling with on is it working the way we want is it still too restricted there's uh, if you look in the dev branch discussions uh, on steam that there's you know ongoing discussion of that including uh, the devs on what really is the right goods flow and kind of a general consensus that as it is right now it's not where it needs to be yet so then um, in any case it's not clear to me that the investment into a lot of markets is worth it right because you can't spend subsidies on these you can't wait for in industry or economy subsidies to build up and build them at a lower cost. Every, every dollar spent on these comes straight out of the treasury, which then directly impacts the government budget's bottom line. And, you know, it comes out of this pool right here. And every time this goes negative, boom, you issue debt. Every time you issue debt, that impacts the credit rating. So I intend to be very sparing on placing federal buildings. That's what I meant by that. That's not campaign specific or, you know, economy de-emphasis. -emph de That's just how I think I want to play the game. Um, I also said I wouldn't be, having just placed a couple salt works in a lumber mill, I also said I, I wouldn't be placing as many uh, of these buildings, which do use subsidies. Again, that's not because I'm trying to lessen the economic uh, aspect of the game for this campaign. It's because it's something I want to try differently. Uh, over the last two campaigns in 1.06, I used the majority of my industry in ag subsidy money to go into uh, factories and uh, farms and, and things like that, right? These industrial buildings. In the projects, however, you've got, uh, let me sort, oh, they were sorted. You have these projects like, you know, subsidized agriculture. Each level of this project will further shorten the time required. Nope, that's not right. There we go. Each level of this project will further increase ag productivity and then subsidize industry. Each level of this project will further increase industrial productivity. So it's kind of a, you know, two different ways to scan the cat. Either you can build more buildings to produce more stuff or you can enhance the buildings you have to produce more stuff. And so I've kind of done option A uh, in the last can uh, last two campaigns. And just this time around, I just want to try op option B. That, that's really all there is to that. Uh, I kind of think option A is the better way to go. And I think that's how I'm probably going to play the game in the future. I just want to try it this way, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I think option A is a little bit better is because subsidized industry, okay, this is going to give us across the board industrial productivity um, improvements over all types of buildings. By building specific buildings, we can better target that, right, toward specific goods, right? We need more provisions, factories. We need more iron. Well, yeah, iron, uh, foundries. Uh, we need more weapons and et cetera, et cetera. Iron works. But we'll try it this way too. Okay, I have talked enough about all that, I think, for now. So, what's going on in the various theaters? Again, we have not advanced time since the last episode. Uh, and 
which we fought uh, a battle here in Manassas. And the Army of the Potomac has been defeated and should be retreating momentarily as soon as I advance time. Okay, so they're kind of beat up. Army of the Shenandoah had recently lost a battle. Uh, where is Army of the Shenandoah going? I, th I think they're still retreating, right? They lost the battle up here at Front Royal Bridge and started retreating, and they, and they decided to come around here down the valley. And I think they have to go apparently as far as Stanton before they reach a Confederate-controlled IIP. So they may still be in retreat mode. Not sure about that. Okay, in the Appalachian Theater. <clears throat> so, as mentioned before, Army of the Northwest has been reinforced and they're up to 11,000 men. And uh, those 11,000 men are in Ohio. <laughs> we don't want that. They're building a supply depot here. Okay, so McClellan's uh, Appalachian Army needs to do something about that, and he's got about 11,000 men. Well, as we've seen over the last couple of uh, battles, casualty ratios, uh, I don't know, 11,000 against 11,000? So what I'm doing is uh, I've got a couple of more artillery units coming to McClellan's Army, and back up at our recruiting depot, the Eastern Department. We've got a few infantry brigades which are under recruitment and are going to arrive very soon. The closest, we have two brigades here under Mansfield and Hooker arriving in two days. I'm going to send both of these brigades to McClellan's army. They should get there fairly fast. They have probably no more than six or seven days. So total of nine days from now. Once he gets those guys, we're going to march on down here and hopefully do something about the Army of the Northwest. And uh, it'll still be a fairly, you know, I think that they're, I think that they'll fight. Now that's not too much of a detour because it is probably better for McClellan to take, the, even if this army weren't here, it's probably better for McClellan to come back into Ohio and go capture Charleston, Virginia by going this route anyway. I think there will be less supply problems doing that than coming down this single road uh, that typically results in supply issues, even before um, 1.06 uh, and 1.07. And there's a salt works there. That'll help, too. <laughs> so that's kind of the near-term plan for the Appalachians. Grant's army, he's got all of his infantry and I think his artillery as well. He's just waiting on some cav, which I'm not going to wait for. Uh, but he's still at yellow readiness. Once he gets into the green, I think we'll come down here and take Nashville, Tennessee. Or, well, I kind of like to take these forts too. Yeah, I think what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll come down to Clarksville and then we'll come over here and take Fort Donaldson. And hopefully the presence of this railroad will be enough to keep him in somewhat decent supply. Maybe. He may have supply issues doing that. Uh, but Polk's command is still... It's at 6,000 now, projected to increase to 12,000. And Grant has uh, over 16,000. I, I think that's viable. We'll, we'll do that. At least that's my current plan. 
when it comes time to do it, I may decide to do something else. But either going for Nashville or heading over here and start working on these forts. Either one, I think, is fine. And then finally, over here in Missouri, if I can find it. Missouri State Guard had come up here uh, north of the Missouri River, past Jefferson City, and they are up here, and they have just finished building a supply depot. And I see no reason not to go chase them away. Only 2,600 men. So the Missouri Army, it's, he's actually had these orders for a couple episodes. It's just we haven't advanced time because of the battles in Virginia. He's been under orders, and Lyon has been marching over here to kind of shoo them away. He's got 9,700 men. There's 2,600 men here. I would expect that this force, uh, which is probably still under the command of Sterling Price, uh, will probably just retreat. And if they don't, I, I would imagine that battle shouldn't be too much of a problem. The wild card there is... There's another army in the Trans-Mississippi, and that is the Western Army for the Confederacy. Last known to be not, also not that big, currently 2,400, 5,500 projected. But this location is two months old, right? This is their campaign start position. We don't know where they are. If it wasn't for Fort Pillow... We could send a scout down here and run up the uh, Arkansas River and have a look, uh, but we can't because Fort Pillow is still there. <laughs> All right, so that's uh, that's kind of an overview of what's going on in the various theaters, and that sounds like a fine time to advance the clock. Forty minutes into the episode. Okay, so I want these two armies close enough to reinforce, but I do want them spread apart a little bit, just so that we can be better able to respond to, let's put the uh, Shenandoah army here in the gap, and we'll just move the Potomac army kind of over here, and we'll just put them right on Manassas. I think they can still reinforce each other at that distance, and we're still covering the approaches to Washington and Winchester. And we'll put them both in defensive mode. <clears throat> There's pluses and minuses, right? I'm not saying this is the way to do it. I, I, I just kind of like defensive mode as the default stance for an army. More engineering points and not guaranteed, but I think it increases the likelihood of a defensive situation, which I think is tactically advantageous and is probably appropriate for the time period. Okay, it looks... Yeah, I don't think he's stationary. I think he's just slowed down a lot by the river. And actually, he is more... Uh, Jubal Early. This is Jubal Early commanding us now. I guess Joe Johnston must have gotten wounded in the battle. Still 6,000. Projected to eventually receive 23,000. He's marching back north. Sort of. Through a river. <laughs> And the Army of the Potomac has fallen back far enough. He's probably down here at Richmond now. Or, no, here he is. He's Supply Depot building here, so he is at... Is this Culpepper? Yeah. Uh, Gordon. No, Gordonsville. Okay. I mentioned this before. But just to kind of show again the point. That the attrition, the uh, return to service number, 2.5k, not nearly enough to cover attrition and casualties. And I have recruited a lot of men 
already in this campaign. A lot of brigades. And we've we started the campaign with a total of 70,000 men. We're, we're only up to 94,000. And I'm pretty confident that in any previous version of the game, including 1.06, uh, that I would have topped over 100 million. Uh, 100 million. 100k by now. Okay, our, uh, our picket boats, our river pickets, our bait pickets, they're up to yellow readiness. That's, that's enough. So we'll, we'll start setting up our little uh, picket lines. Put one, one right here. Send one here. I hope I built enough. I may not have. We'll just kind of get them in the area and then I'll adjust them so that they cover a little bit better. I may be kind of spacing them too close at the moment. I feel like I had another one. I thought I built six. No? Only five? Pick at 16. Twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Shouldn't I be able to double click on them? No. Well, somewhere I've got a stupid picket boat that I don't. <laughs> I can't. Here, let's just unselect him and then go. There he is. Oh, he's not showing his NATO symbol. Yeah, for I, I've noticed this before at uh, Newcastle. He's sitting right here. But he doesn't get his little uh, icon. Once we move him over here, it'll show up. And about here. Okay. For those who may have not seen the previous episode where I've talked about this, sometimes the CSA likes to do kind of zany amphibious operations and they'll come up here and land in, on the eastern seaboard like in New York or they'll come up the bay and land around Baltimore. And uh, so I have this picket line that's set up out here where any waterborne CSA land force army has to go through the combat radius of one of these things and may get turned around as a result. And then I realized, oh, I need to do the same thing over here. Oh, wait a minute. I need to do the same thing over here. And so that's that's what these guys are doing. They're setting up a little kind of force where anyone who wants to use the Potomac River or the Chesapeake Bay for waterborne transport has to go through these gunboats. Okay, does he have those 26? He does not. I 
Okay, Patterson is back up in green readiness. He's recovered a few men. He seems to be in a fine supply situation for ammo and food and forage. And he's back up to confident morale. Barely. 65%. Right now, we think Early only has the 6,000 men. However, if he gets all those brigades real quick before we get to him, that could be problematic. <laughs> because, you know, Patterson's got 13,000 men. So I think what I'm going to do is let's get... Uh, Let's send McDowell over here. Clearly, he, he just is coming up here to Winchester. So let's send McDowell here. Railroad transport. And then let's, and then let's let, let uh, Patterson come just far enough to ensure that he can engage, or that he can reinforce. He only needs to move that far. I don't think he needs to force march or use the railroad. Okay. And hopefully we can make contact and shoo him away before he actually finishes capturing Winchester. to now. He's coming up here to construct a, a supply depot while he's sitting next to a supply depot. Early, what are you doing? And he's not, he's not going to move, right? It's, it, not as long as this supply depot is under construction. Okay. Um, and Beauregard's not going to move as long as this supply depot is under construction. Great. Kind of similar to what's going on in Missouri, which I need to go take a look at. Let's go send uh, the Potomac Army up here to chase Early away from Harper's Ferry. Sure, use the railroad. That's fine. And I don't think he needs Patterson for that. Advancing time would help there, wouldn't it? <clears throat> Did that movement order not... Yeah. That movement order didn't take for some reason. Sometimes that happens. Question is, is it gonna went into a siege? Well, that's fine. What is the siege situation? Really? <laughs> Twenty one thousand men to uh oh. Has he gotten more men already? Did he get his uh he got some. He's that. Yeah, that army's bigger than what Intel said it was. It's it's big enough where he doesn't want to run. It's still a lot smaller than ours, though. Okay. Um, and I think he may have more guns. Kind of hurting in guns. I need to do something about that. All right. I think I'm gonna convert this into a tactical battle. I don't think Patterson will be involved. Um, 
but that will have to wait for the next episode. So there's our first uh, campaign map only um, episode of this particular series. Why? Because I went and talked a bunch about economy. <laughs> but I think it was all stuff well worth discussing. If you like what we're doing with the channel, if you like the content, then leave a like, leave a comment, maybe even subscribe if you are so inclined. If you're new to the series, new to the channel, want to see what's been going on with this uh, particular series, uh, want to see the other episodes, I'm linking a playlist here in the end card. At any rate, thank you very, very much for watching. I appreciate it.